Today we've got a great malicious compliance story all about manning the phones. We'll get into that in a bit, but first, just do your job. Stop acting like you're important. This is a long one. I've tried to restrain my verbose tendencies as best as I could, but it's still a lot. Sorry. As such, the story may seem a bit truncated in places. That's me trying to keep the word count down. I've kept details vague deliberately since I generally don't like giving identifying information. Background. Some years back at the start of my career, I worked in insurance. My team was new and our boss, let's call her Alice, was very ambitious. She'd started off as a team lead managing a similar team to ours, and through spending most of her time networking, bootlicking, and making herself the center of important, high visibility projects, she'd managed to score a promotion to manager and was given our team along with her old one. This was very unusual since she should have gotten two team lead positions to run said teams, but that's how it worked out. She'd already been disinclined to pay much attention to the actual work even before her promotion. After, we basically barely ever saw her. Her ambitions hadn't stopped at her current achievements, so she was always busy trying to keep climbing the corporate ladder. So that the teams could actually run, she picked the two most ambitious people from each team and made them do her job with no promotion or pay increase. I was that person from my team. For about a year, I trained my colleagues, handled payment authorizations through a roundabout way to circumvent company policy, which said I absolutely wasn't allowed to do that, handled disputes within the team, checked over and corrected other people's work, etc. Our company had a policy that once a year, we had a skip level one-to-one -one with our boss's boss. At that meeting, I brought up how unnatural our situation was. The senior manager replied that she hadn't known myself and the person from the other team were doing so much, and agreed that the structure should be reverted to how it's supposed to be. Indeed, a couple of weeks later, internal postings for two team lead positions get posted on the company intranet. Fast forward a month or so, and Alice has gathered the teams to make an announcement. The person who had been doing the team lead job from the other team was being made into one officially. In our team, a girl we'll call Jane was getting it. Now, I wasn't the only one flabbergasted. Both teams were extremely confused and several people even voiced that confusion. I didn't know this at the time and only became aware during my eventual exit interview, but Alice had not liked that I'd gone over her head, even if she'd benefited from it ultimately. So, in retaliation, she'd given the actual position I'd been doing up until that point to someone else. In a one-to-one -one meeting with her later when I brought this subject up, she got angry and said, Just do your job. Stop acting like you're important. The malicious compliance. Remember how I said Alice was too busy to ever do her actual job. She paid attention to none of it, including individual team performance. Jean had only been picked because she'd been a part of Alice's old team originally and was perceived as loyal to Alice. We'd needed someone to do really boring data entry parts of the job, which nobody else wanted to do, and the other team had recommended her. I guess we should have been suspicious at that point as to why they were so eager, but Alice had approved it. As it turned out, they'd wanted rid of her, because Jane was stupid. I'm not using that as an insult, but as a descriptor. She was genuinely very unintelligent and struggled with anything beyond very basic data entry tasks. When she was made to do anything harder, she'd generally make a complete mess of it. And now she had to actually run an entire team, train people, approve payments, check other people's work and so on. All while she herself struggled with anything more complicated than transferring numbers from one system into another. I honestly don't believe Alice was aware of how big of a blunder she'd made here. She just picked someone she thought of as loyal. Of course, Jane tried to have me basically babysit every action she took, but I was having none of it. I was going to do my own job and nothing else since I wasn't important. For context for our US friends, we all had contracts with detailed job descriptions and in my country, you can't just fire people for no reason. And refusal to do work that's not in the job description is certainly not considered proper cause. I was just a regular employee. None of the management functions I'd been performing up till then were my actual job. The fallout? The team crashed hard over the next three months. Complaints went from less than five a month to over 20 on average. A lot of the incorrect payments were doing out. A huge backlog of cases were piling up. Nobody else on the team wanted to help Jane because they knew they'd end up just having to do her job for her for no benefit. The funniest thing was, 
Alice barely had an inkling there was a problem. Beyond me being uncooperative, which she was pretty vindictive about, because she was busy advancing her career and Jane didn't want to admit how hopelessly out of her depth she was. Things came to a head when the quarterly reports caused alarm bells to ring amongst the leadership team. An internal audit was organized and a lot of the mistakes that had gone through and a whole bunch of leakage were uncovered. Alice had to go explain herself as to why our performance was suddenly so terrible. At this point she'd finally realized she should have paid more attention to the situation, but unbeknownst to even her, it was too late. Everything from here on is hearsay. I learned it from a friend who was a team lead of a completely different team, so take it with a grain of salt. Apparently there had been talks about outsourcing teams to India. However, Alice's boss, the one who opened the team lead positions, had been staunchly against it, since it would diminish her fiefdom. The proponents of the outsourcing managed to use our team's horrible quarterly results to justify using the two teams under Alice as a pilot for the outsourcing program. Quite literally the next day after I'd accepted a position in a different company and was planning on giving notice, we were gathered and informed our teams would be shuttered in four months and that we'd be training our replacements in India during that period. I heard from colleagues who stayed till the end that Alice was not offered another position after her teams were made redundant. Not surprising really, open manager positions and new teams didn't exactly grow on trees. Sadly, the pilot was considered a success, which honestly I personally find somewhat dubious, but the Indian center was certainly a lot cheaper than us, and I learned via LinkedIn about a year and a half later that the entire department had been shuttered. So realistically, the whole thing was probably inevitable, but at the very least, Alice could have bought herself an extra year if she cared a bit more. If somebody could do better if they cared a bit more, but they just don't and they can't, were they ever truly capable? Our next story is, keep your phone calls in your pay grade. I was stationed on USS Sunfish, SSN 649, from 1991 to 1995. During the time I was there, the crew complement was 130 men, 14 officers, 12 chiefs, and 104 E6 and below, blue shirts. The boat had three telephone lines. Having communicated with some of my friends and colleagues on other boats in mine and our sister squadron, submarine squadrons 6 and 8, I knew that some boats had their own phone lines designated as co slash exo, commanding officer slash executive officer, officers in chiefs, and the crew line. On Sunfish, however, the three phone lines were simply the three phone lines. If the phone rang, you pick it up, and you got the person asked for or took a message. If you wanted to make a call, you chose whatever line was available. That is, until late 1993, when our new navigator Nav reported aboard. The Nav is the operations department head and is third in command. The new Nav came equipped with his own great ideas on how things were going to be. One of his ideas included changes to the phone lines, which were under the purview of the operations department. Sunfish joined the cadre of boats with specifically designated phone lines. Per his orders, only the commanding officer, executive officer, and yeoman, the executive department, were to use the CO slash XO phone line. Only officers and chiefs were to use their designated phone lines, and of course, the crew had their line. The NAV discussed this policy every single day at muster time. Why? Because everyone rolled their eyes and simply disregarded the new rule. Everyone disregarded this new rule up until he started inspecting. Because of course, you can't expect much if you're willing to inspect. When he saw someone talking on the phone, he'd check what line they were using. Of course, he never checked anyone in the executive department. He bothered the chiefs a bit until the chief of the boat, Command Master Chief, told him to freak off and not talk to his chiefs. The nav did, however, chew out the officers in blue shirts whenever he caught them using the inappropriate phone for their pay grade. People started grumbling. The nav stepped up his game soon enough though, as his phone inspections and butt chewings weren't getting him the quick results he wanted. He had the officers follow his lead. For any calls for blue shirts on the wrong phone line, the caller was directed to call back at the appropriate phone number, then the call was ended. Crap hit the fan. The phones were located in the attack center. Yeoman's office, and the wardroom. While many people go to the attack center throughout the day, the fire control techs, FTs, and quartermasters, QMs, were the only ones who were primarily occupied in that workspace. Previous to the new NAV's arrival, they had to listen to that phone ringing constantly all day. With the NAV's new policy, 
They muted both the commanding officer slash executive officer and officer slash chief lines. The nav forbade the crew from muting any phone lines, except for the yeoman in their office. But whenever he asked who muted those lines in the attack center, he just got blank stares and shrugs from whoever happened to be there. As soon as he left, the non-blue shirt lines ended up muted again. Nobody ever wanted to answer the phone and have to go running all over the boat to find people. But now the crew started doing the same thing as the officers did. If the phone call was for anyone above the pay grade of E6, they simply told them to call back on the correct line and hung up. Suddenly, quite a bit of work was not getting done. Messages weren't getting passed. Maintenance with our assigned submarine tender was suffering due to them not knowing anything about our designated phone lines. Of course, not many people were willing to walk up and down all those decks on the tender, then down the pier when they couldn't get through on the phone. The nav tried to make the cooks, MSs, answer the wardroom phone as the wardroom was one of their workspaces. The cooks were always busy and were never good about answering the phones to begin with. Sometimes they would answer the blue shirt phone because they were blue shirts, but never the officer or chief line, unless an officer was in the wardroom to see the unless an officer was in the wardroom to see them ignore the ringing phone. The cooks would laugh that if they answered the officer slash chief line, they'd simply tell the caller to hold on, set the receiver down, and walk away. Things simply didn't go well regarding the new phone policy. Leadership, namely the NAV, created the problem. Leadership was blamed for all the setbacks in maintenance and repairs. Leadership was blamed by all the families having trouble reaching their family members aboard ship. The chiefs suffered their setbacks but were humored by the crap show. And the blue shirts started to love the new phone policy. They got to watch a bunch of things burn down. Of course, when we answered the phone, we had to identify the boat, that the call was on a non-secure line, and state our name. But everyone talked so fast that there was no understanding or accountability as to who answered the phones. It was truly a, the beatings will continue until morale improves situation. By the numbers, most of the crew made a good time of the whole situation, and really enjoyed pointing out that everything was great, until the new nav showed up. I mean, really, the problem here is, is they instituted this with no, like, training, no practice, no foresight as to how this could possibly work or interrupt the entire workflow everybody has going on. Through and through, this was set up to be a failure from the get-go because there was no logical thinking or process ever attempted to be put in place. Our next story is self-scanner usage. I was shopping at a large home improvement store a few years ago. Think of a place with orange signage. They used to have a particularly nasty woman who worked by the checkouts. You could tell she thought we were all stupid and beneath her. It was very early on a Sunday morning and I had a cart full of assorted items. I knew some of the items wouldn't scan. The only thing open were the four self-service registers. I asked the woman if I could get some help because I knew something wouldn't scan. She didn't even look up from what she was doing and in the most condescending voice possible said, All you have to do is run it over the scanner, just scan it. I scanned my small bag of grass seed. I scanned my bottle of plant food. I scanned the new igniter kit for my grill. Then I grabbed one of the landscaping pavers and plopped it down on the scanner glass. The sound coming from the machine would seem to indicate it wasn't scanning. I flipped it over and tried the other side. The scanner made more protesting noises. Now I had every employee in the area over trying to help me. Of course, the manager came over and they were trying to make a huge scene. There was another customer who was standing right there who called out the employee and said she was very rude to me when I asked for help and said I was following her instructions perfectly. Needless to say, I left with all my stuff. I don't know how long self-serve number three was out of commission. It was still closed the next weekend. I never saw that employee there again. Self-serve registers are all pretty cool and nice and dandy until they don't freaking work. The worst is when you have to make that daring attempt to enter like Walmart and you want to go through and there somehow ends up always being five huge families standing right behind you in line for the same self-service register. That's when there ends up being some kind of an issue with this register. It almost makes you miss the old stand in line, have the cashier ring everything up for you. Oh, the tag isn't on that item, it must be free interactions. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another awesome malicious compliance story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.